two, one. Hey, good evening, everybody. I am here. Well, I, I like to say good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Whenever you happen to tune in, this is Brother Rob Wilson. I'm here in the studio interviewing Stephen Snook, uh, a brother I met a few weeks ago who has an incredible testimony. Good evening, Stephen. How you doing, Rob? I'm doing good, man. I'm glad we finally got around to this. This might be the first of many times we do something like this. If, you, if you're willing, I'm willing. Awesome. We, um, we met a few weeks ago, and you said it was kind of, a, kind of a quirky thing I did when I first met you. What was that I did? Just let's be, let's be real. <laughs> yeah. You know, the first thing that uh, you said, uh, uh, another brother and myself uh, that go to a, a different meeting on Thursday nights, we came into the meeting that, that you attend on Thursday nights and we sat down and you looked at us and you said, are you disciples of Jesus Christ? <laughs> very bold, very mm -hmm. bold. Mm -hmm. And the answer from both of us was yes. And mm -hmm. then you asked us for how long? Mm -hmm. And then my buddy explained and then I gave a, a brief explanation also. Mm -hmm. Well, I just wanted to make sure I want to know who's at the table with me. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Because everybody doesn't think of themselves the same way. You could have thought of yourself as a Christian, you know, and then I'd have yeah. to say, well, what do you mean by that? But if you say you're a disciple, I know what a disciple is. A, a disciple is a student and a follower of Jesus, you know, who's putting the life of Christ into practice in their life. So, I mean, I got a definition for a disciple, but I sometimes when people say they're Christians or, well, yeah, I go to church, but so then, then I could really... Um, relate to you so yeah i wanted to know who you were who's at the table who is this who are these people at the table we got guests here let's ensure they're part of the family so you were a little surprised at first but then you real you appreciated that you said 100 mm -hmm. i am a firm believer that the gospel is to be spoken boldly mm -hmm. and with authority that god never mm -hmm. called a, a a weak man or a woman to be a christian it's, it's a bold faith that's to be um, that dominion, that the exercise of that authority is, is to be done boldly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I gave it some thought and I said, mm -hmm. the man was right on the money. Mm -hmm. Because if you weren't, I mean, we could try to make sure that you were by the time you left that night. You know, you don't have to, Absolutely. you know, if someone is a disciple, you don't have to re represent the gospel to them. So anyway, yeah. So, uh, then you contact me a few days later, we've been shooting messages back and forth and, you have an interesting testimony. You haven't always been a Christian. Oh, no. No, I did not grow up in church. Um, total in my life, I had probably been to church in the free world maybe three times, maybe four times in my entire life. Mm -hmm. Which is a very low number for America because there's a church on every corner in America. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's plenty of churches. There's just there's just not enough disciples. There's not enough disciples. Disciples aren't like, you know, disciples are the people who are really walking this out 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. It's a life for them. It's not a it's not a practice. You know, you can be a Christian and say, "Well, I go to church, you know, 3 times a month and I pray every now and then and I definitely go on Easter." and on Christmas, and, you know, whatever. And they call themselves a Christian. But for me, and for you, this is something that saved our lives, right? Radically transformed our lives. So before Christ, what was going on with you? Well, let me say, uh, Rob, I agree with you 100% on that. I never, in, in my wildest dreams, would I ever become a Christian or join any religion as a form of a social group. I, I've never needed anything like that. I've been a gangster my whole life. You know, I grew up in a life of crime from a very young age. Um, you know, my upbringing is, is, is an interesting one. You know, I was adopted as a child, very young child. Um, I was raised by my aunt, her husband, who was a severe boxer, uh, a severely uh, alcoholic and was also a boxer, a very violent man. And uh, so he essentially raised my brother and myself uh, and, you know, like wolves. And, um, you know, it was just a very 
strange, very hard upbringing. And um, we were the fruit of that. And just just for a little information, I, I received word just this morning that my brother was in the hospital right now for a drug overdose. Mm. Um, he ran away from home when he turned 14. He couldn't take it anymore. And then in 2003, just a few months after I went to federal prison to start my sentence, um, our mother killed herself. And he happened to be there with her in the vehicle when she killed herself. So he's had a very difficult time recovering from that. Um, it probably took him close to 10 years to really talk to me about the situation on a visit when he came to visit me one time uh, while I was still in federal prison. I believe I was in North Carolina at that time. So he's been through quite a bit and he still struggles with that a little bit. But uh, we have talked a lot about the Lord and a lot about the, the way um, the remedy has been presented to him. But uh, the enemy is trying to hold on to him. So we'll hold him up in prayer, man. He's in the hospital right now. He went there yesterday. Wow, sorry to hear that. Hmm. He'll be fine. He'll be fine. He's going to recover. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so what? Um, so, go ahead and tell me. Uh, you know what? What happened? Landed you in prison? You said right, and you weren't. A, you obviously weren't a follower then. But so, what was what led up to being in prison? Well, I became a drug dealer when I was about fifteen. But if I back up just a couple years before that, uh, Rob, I was a very good chess player. I went to a gifted program as a child. Um, I played chess at a very high level. When I was a freshman in high school, I won the state of Illinois chess championship. But we grew up in abstract poverty. And besides the poverty, it, it was complete madness in my house. Uh, I told this story many times that my uncle actually shot a shotgun off in the front room of our house and blew up a fish tank. So, you know, we had that type of craziness all the time. By the time I was 15 or 16, I was determined to get out of there. Uh, so I started selling marijuana. I got a, I moved in with my brother. I say got a place, but he already had the place. I moved in with him and I started to take care of him, his girlfriend, the girlfriend that I had at the time and myself by selling marijuana and just kind of graduated through the, through the, the ranks and graduated into harder drugs, started selling cocaine, crack, um, you know, just whatever was available that I could turn some money on. Um, and what, what landed me in prison for the longest time, um, when you get sentenced in the federal system, the way that they do that is they base your time on drug weight. The time that they give you is determined by how much is the quantity of the weight of the drug and your prior convictions. Well, I had, when I caught my federal case in 2003, I had two prior convictions. One was for selling marijuana, which I received probation for. And the other one was I had a 17 year old girlfriend when I was 21, which is against the law. So when I caught the drug case in 2003, the government was able to use those two prior convictions to enhance me as a career criminal. And they gave me 22 years in prison. Ooh. I was released in uh, February of this year. Wow. Wow, that's intense, man. So what happened? Yeah. Um, what what was the uh, the sentence like? You went in there, hard, hardened, ruthless. Yeah, I went a hard man, a leader of a of a drug organization, and uh, that stretched all the way down into Mexico. Uh, the first time that I ever went to jail was on uh, for any significant length of time was on the Mexican border down in McAllen, Texas, which is on the news quite a bit now down in the valley by Brownsville. So I was plugged in with the guys, you know, and uh, I was a bad guy. There was no doubt. And uh, I, so I, when I fell in the federal system in 2003, I'd been to prison before. So um, I knew I was getting ready to go do a lot of time. I kind of knew how to do time. I was going to work out and, and do things to keep my mind occupied. Like, nobody can conceive of how long 20 years in prison really is. You think that you may be able to conceive it, but it it doesn't hit you with the full force until you've been there about five years. And then based on my experience, after 10 years, people start to go a little bit crazy. And so a 20 year sentence is a really significant chunk of your life. Mm -hmm. But in in 2003, a few months after I, I caught that case, I got a visit in the county jail from my brother and uh, my younger brother. I have two brothers, my younger brother. And I told him to go do something because I was still very criminally minded. And I told him to go do something to uh, collect some money for me. And um, I found out a few days later, 
through a phone call that he had been in a, a, a deadly car accident in a high-speed police chase running from the cops, um, throwing weapons out of the vehicle after being involved in a shooting. And that's when I got born again. That's when I, that's when I just gave up. I didn't understand really what born again was. Um, I, of course, being in America, I'd heard about Jesus. I just didn't, at that moment, I just didn't know what else to do. And so I just went into my room and I just hit my knees and I just said, told the Lord, I just, I can't take this anymore. And I need you to come into my life. You know, and I think a lot of that was praying for God to save my brother's life because I knew he was on life support. And, um, and he did that. You know, that's, a, that's another testimony altogether because actually a, a, a female uh, pastor went into the hospital while he was on life support and he, and he was still on the breathing machine. He was able to get visits and people came in there and she laid her hands on him and she said, no, she said, he's not going to die. He is going to live. So, <laughs> so that's when I, that's when I got born again. Thanks God. So that was, that was about six months after you were in? Yeah, it was, it wasn't long after that, that my mom killed herself. And, you know, you just go through all that. But at the same time, um, one of the things that God did was he laid something on me that I wasn't familiar with at the time. And, you know, the way the Holy Spirit works, I wasn't familiar with the Holy Spirit or, or how any of the life of a Christian works. I mean, there was there was a long period of time where I was taking communion every day, Rob. I was taking communion every day because I read in the Bible that is, you know, as often as you remember me, you know, something similar to that, you need to do this. I would do it before every meal. Mm -hmm. I just didn't understand any of those traditions or anything. But, you know, the Lord put it on me uh, probably a month, maybe a month and a half after I, I asked him into my heart. He said, today you're going to start reading the Bible and you're not going to eat. And uh, so that's what I did. And I ended up borrowing a Bible from an old black fella that was in my cell block and I read it straight through. Mm -hmm. And I just sat there and read it straight through in about 11 days. And the anointing, you know, the, the Holy Spirit's just on you. And we just kind of turned that cell block over a period of time. It went from BET Rap City to watching the Trinity Broadcast Network. <laughs> I'm not kidding, you, brother. It was awesome. So when I got on the airplane after sentencing and went to federal prison, I mean, the Lord was there with me. And he was putting the right people in my path. And, um, you know, I was thankful for that because in federal prison and in all prisons, there's a lot of strange doctrines. It's a breeding ground for Muslims, Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, every type of cult that you can imagine, the right. nation of Islam. That, that's their, their place. And you see a lot of guys get caught up in that. And God put the right people in my path. Um, you know, and it just kind of went like that. You know, that I would say the greatest experience that ever happened to me in my life um besides the events that took place in 2017 was what happened in 2004 when i received the baptism of the holy spirit to me that was you know greater than even my children being born you know because i was by myself um you know it wasn't a situation where you know one of the methods where somebody laid hands on me or anything like that it was something i prayed for and i prayed for boldly and i and uh, and god answered i'll praise the lord thank you jesus so he he took away from you a heart of stone I gave you a heart of flesh, right? You know, he did. Mm -hmm. He really did. But there was a lot in me, Rob, that had to get out. You know, it wasn't like uh, that happened and that was just floating on clouds for the next 20 years. I was in prison. I had to conduct myself and carry myself like a man. Um, and I was never the type of guy in prison to take a Bible and just kind of run to chapel because a lot of times in prison, the guys that do that are really over there hiding from something. Um, so I was more of a, I was more of a witness for God, uh, for the Lord to guys that were still involved in crime. You know what I mean? Inside of prison because they knew my faith. They knew that they could come and talk to me about those things. If they were going through something, if their mom died or one of those types of situations, they could, they knew they could come and talk to me about it. We could get the Bible out or, or talk about whatever we needed to talk about. So what happened? Uh, tell me about the rest of your time in there. I mean, some of the big events and stuff. Well, I got in a bad fight in 2005 while I was laying on my bed reading the Bible. And just one of them things. And, and uh, the guy just, he really didn't know the type of person that he was getting ready to, to fight. He didn't know that he was going to go fight a, a white guy that weighed 165 pounds that had been trained how to fight his whole life. 
So he thought he was just going to come in there and slap some punk, and it just didn't work out like that. You can only imagine. I won't embellish on that. But uh, so we went to solitary confinement, obviously. And while I was in solitary confinement, and this is a story that everybody always loves, and it's impacted me. I, I, I would be amiss if I said it didn't impact me because I've carried it with me my whole life because it, it opened my eyes to something that I've been able to hold on to. And I'd, I'd like to give that to anybody that would, that would listen to it and believe what I'm about to say because it's a guaranteed fact that this is exactly how it went down. After two weeks in solitary confinement, you have to see what's called the disciplinary hearing officer. They determine based on the evidence and the camera evidence, did you in fact get in a fight? Were you uh, the uh, instigator or were you defending yourself? And then they'll find you guilty or not guilty and determine your punishment based on that. So I went in there. Um, leading up to that, I had a lieutenant come to my door and he said, hey, uh, you were fighting this guy, right? So I, I, I'm not going to, I'm not just going to tell on myself, you know, it's not in me to do that. And he said, before you say anything, I want to let you know that we just watched the camera. We watched the tape. We'd like to know how you learned how to fight like that, really. So I said, yeah, you watched the tape. You know, that's what happened. So I see the disciplinary hearing officer and I get my sanction. They're going to keep me in solitary confinement for a few more weeks. But what has to happen is they have to move me from the room that I'm in, where I have a few things that I'm allowed to have while I'm waiting to be sentenced, which is my radio and some commissary to eat. So they take the, all that from you. They take you and put you on a special wing where you're totally isolated behind a steel door and you'll just be with you and your roommate. So they take me into the cell, Rob, and I'm cuffed up behind my back and they put me in the cell and I back up to the chuck hole to get the cuffs off my wrists. And the officer said, no, step to the back of the cell. You're getting a roommate. Uh, so I said, okay, yeah, that's normal. So I stepped to the back of the cell. He opens the door and they swing another guy in and put him in and close the door. As he's backing up to get the cuffs off his back and I'm looking at him, making eye contact, he's got two bones, one on each side of his face sticking out of each cheek. And he's got one coming out of his nose here. They're just white, looks like bones, not something that you would normally see somebody have in prison but because of the way they'd been put in his face, the Bureau of Prisons couldn't take him out of his face without a wow. surgery. <laughs> Got one here, one here, one through the nose. I'm looking at him, cuffed behind my back. They take the cuffs off him first. He's got the craziest looking in his eye you've ever seen. Good sized guy, long hair, tattoos everywhere, neck, everything's blasted out with tattoos. When he goes to move by me, for me to be able to position myself to the door, this is my most vulnerable position as a prisoner. You understand that because right. I'm cuffed and he's not. He reaches into his waistband and he pulls out a knife. It's about this long. I'm going to say it's probably 12 to 14 inches long, including the handle. I'm looking at him right in his eye. He takes that knife and he sets it under the top bunk and he puts the mattress down. I walk over, get the cuffs off of me, and I never take my eyes off of him. He steps to the back of the cell, the cop takes the cups off, closes the chuck hole, and the cop walks away. I'm looking at him, and he said, you're a Christian, aren't you? I said, yeah, I am a Christian. This was in 2005, now the fall of 2005. I'm already born again, and in 2004, I received a baptism in the Holy Spirit. 2005, I get in a fight. I said, yeah, I am a Christian. I said, but why would you ask me that, man? because I'm back here in solitary confinement for fighting. He said, the reason I ask you is because I'm a devil worshiper, a real one. He said, I'm involved in witchcraft in all areas of the demonic. Mm. And when they put me in this room, I could feel vibrations in my body because of the spirit that's in you. Mm, wow. He said, I need you to do something. He said, as long as we're in this cell, don't ever touch me. I said, I'll never touch you, dog. I can't see a situation where I would touch you. He said, promise me, you'll never touch me. I said, I said I'll never touch you. So we started to communicate a little bit. He was able to receive his property, the books that he kept, that he traveled with and read. And he wasn't lying. He had all the books on demonic witchcraft and, you know, voodooism and things of that nature. Um, and of course, I was able to get my Bible. And uh, so we made a little deal, you know what I mean? Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ without question. And I said, you know, why don't we do this? Why don't we read a little bit of the New Testament and we'll read some of yours, too? He said, well, you're not scared to do that? I said, well, no, I'm not scared to do that. I said, brother, I'm protected by Jesus. 
I said, I, I'm protected by the one, the king, the one that runs that realm that you're delving into. And he said, all right. So we started from the beginning. We started in Matthew, and we just started reading a few chapters a night, and I'd read them out loud, and I'd grab his trash and read it out loud, and then read, read the Bible, and after about a week, bro, he didn't want to read it anymore. He said, let's just stay with yours, man. Just go ahead and read yours. So we, we finished up the New Testament all the way till probably the book of Revelation. We didn't get into Revelation much, which I was thankful for that because I didn't have the knowledge to get in there with them at that time. And I ended up, you know, getting out of solitary confinement a few weeks later and, and going back out to general population. Wow. That's the power of the word. Matt. That's the power of the word. Somebody said one Greater time. Greater is he. You don't have to defend the truth. You just have to set it loose and it will defend itself. You know? Yeah. Praise God. That's, yeah, that's a confirmation, brother, on on First John 4, 4, I believe. That became my favorite scripture in my Christian walk is that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Mm -hmm. If this man's telling me that he is a full-blown devil worshiper, and I learned this later throughout the years, that one person that I had never had to convince about the existence of God was a true Satan worshiper or someone that was involved in Santeria because they understand that the spiritual realm's real. They know there's a God. They know that Jesus is real and that he's the son of God. And they're just choosing to go a different direction. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a, a regular mainstream American where you have to kind of battle with them if they're at atheists or whatever the case may be and try to convince them of the existence of God before you can really talk to them about the Lord. These guys know, you know, you don't have to, they're going to convince you that there's a spiritual realm because they've seen stuff, you know. Wow, that's, that's amazing. That's a testimony right there. And, it, and all it does is, is it, yeah, is it, and it just gives you um, confirmation of the veracity and the strength of the word itself. And it doesn't require, uh, I was just reading the other night, you know, on one of the videos I did about Paul saying that he says, when, uh, when I came to you, I did not come preaching with eloquent words of wisdom so that the cross of Christ would not be um, robbed of its power because the message of the cross is the power of God and salvation. It doesn't require the most fancy orator or the best. Or it doesn't require, matter of fact, a Joel Osteen doesn't even have the power of the cross. But man, he can talk, but he can't get a soul sure. saved because he's talking about, you know, all of this, uh, your best life now and, you know, name it and claim it and blab it and grab it, you know. But you know. Mm. And it, it reminds me, your life, my life, I didn't spend, I didn't get caught like, like you did, but I could have got caught, okay? I was out there doing the wild child stuff, doing the bad kid stuff. But it reminds me of that verse that says, um, until I went astray, you know, I until I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I have learned to follow your way. You know that verse it's like in the going astray and in the inflict, uh, uh, the affliction that comes from going astray, that's God's love. God disciplines those he loves and chastises everyone whom he receives as a son. You know, you know that yeah. verse? And, and it's like... Automatic, of course. <laughs> yeah. And it's like many people think if, if you're nice to people, oh, they'll get saved. Or if you're... If you're good to people, they'll get saved. No, 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 no. I'm not saying don't be good to people. But I'm saying, um, actually, I've found that some of the people who are the most radical and the most real transformations are people whom God has smitten or broken or brought to, you know, they have come to the consequences of their sins and it has broken them. Most people, well, it's like Psalm 51. David says the sacrifices of God. Are a broken spirit and a contrite heart, O oh God, thou will not despise. So he puts you in a place where your spirit was broken, where where the Absolutely. the old man was broken, you know, where the wild stallion running out there on that range for the flesh and the devil was broken. And then, you know, now you're in the master's hands. And I know what you're talking about. When you have you have a new heart. You have a new desire, but all of it's like all of your old instincts are very near the surface. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You you still um, don't have any 
well, wait a minute. I'm used to responding to this situation in this way. <laughs> and you haven't gra- grown in the um, maturity or in the strength to, you know, not react the way you used to react. And maybe in that environment in, in prison, you know, maybe, you know, that fight, maybe that's how you had to react. I don't know. Rob, I used to tell him I'm a radical Christian. <laughs> you know, I used to tell him that, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Keep guys up off of you. And they know that you would take it to, uh, you know, that level. Well, you know, I'm a South Side Christian. I, <laughs> I came from the South Side of the kingdom. Y'all got to realize there's geographic locations in the kingdom. There's a North, there's an East, there's a West, there's a South Side of the kingdom. I'm not one of those, uh, you know, those soft ones. You know, I'm one of those right. ones. That, I came from the fishing crowd. <clears throat> I came from the yeah. ear cutting off crowd. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't raised in church either. Um, awesome. So I came what you might call, you know, you came in what what could be called an unusual way. When people hear stories of people coming to Christ, they hear stories of altar calls and things like that. When you had your altar call in your valley of the shadow of death, so to speak, you know, um, in that broken place, that's kind of where. You know, just just to tad, tad on a little bit. You know, I had had this. My my old man and I were. You know, he was he was a great guy. He was a he was a World War II veteran. He was a factory worker. He survived the Great Depression, but he was a hard. He was a hard man. You know, so he didn't raise me up to be soft and soft and feely. Okay, but he did raise me up to fight. So inevitably, if you raised me up to be tough, how am I going to interact with you? I'm going to be tough. We're going to be at odds with one another. We were always at odds with one another. We had this huge falling out. And I was an angry person, too. I was filled with, you know, with what what he put in with to me and what, you know, things that I thought he should. You know, all the things that a father and son can have, that animosity. And one day, the Lord, one day, something, I got in my car. And it was after I had, like, basically a personal breakdown because of me because because of the problems I was bringing on my own life I went through this emotional this just this collapse and okay so I but after that collapse I'm I'm saying okay I'm gonna I'm gonna get this back together I'm gonna, I'm gonna get it back okay you know all right I'm gonna toughen up and get it back together now so I'm, I'm getting in my car to go to the gym and Steve I heard a voice and I, I'm saying this people are like God doesn't talk to people anymore Look, don't even don't even bring that up to me. I heard something say, what's the strongest thing you could do? It was so powerful, and it wasn't like I didn't have my mind. I was getting ready to go to the gym. I was getting ready to go hit, the, hit some weights. And I heard a voice say, what's the strongest thing you could do? So powerful. I was like, what the? I'm looking in the back of my car. I think there's somebody in the back seat. And I, I was like, what, what was that? And, but then I thought, I stopped, and I thought, I said, I could go forgive my dad. And it, that was like the scariest, but the strongest thing I could do. I knew in my mind and my heart at that moment is that I could go forgive my dad. I ain't a Christian. Okay. So I go over, I'm just, I'm just going to make this quick because this is really about you. But as I'm on route to go forgive him, I went to my mom's house just to try to talk to her and say, Hey, look, I'm going to go make, I'm going to go try to reconcile with this old bird, <laughs> you know, and she wasn't there. And so, dude, you know what I'm talking about. I didn't cry. I didn't cry. Tears didn't come out of my face. You see what I'm saying? That's the man who I was. But something is happening. I have never felt this before. I'm actually feeling emotion, Steve. You know what I'm talking about. So I go in the bathroom. I'm looking at myself eye to eye. And I'm like, okay, okay, put on my game face. Suck it up. And dude, I walked three steps out of that bathroom and I fell out on the floor. Just absolutely fell out, broken, bawling, man, bawling and bawling and bawling. And I'm sitting here shaking. My, I remember my hands were shaking. I was like, God, what is this? What is this? And I'm just, just streaming, just rivers. And I'm asking God what this is and I don't even know God. But, dude, it was every fight. It was every disappointment. 
It was every rejection. It was every word that should have never been said to me. And every word that went unsaid. It was all getting lifted off my shoulders, out of, off my back. And literally, I felt like something came in me. When I got up, you might know this book too. It's like the, the scales fell from my eyes. And I was like, it was like the world went from black and white to color in that, in that moment. And I was like, it was freaky. It was literally like I was, I was born again, okay? I'm not saying I was born again yet because I didn't know what had just happened. But I go, I reconcile with my father that day. I kept hearing that voice tell me that whole conversation. It, that voice kept saying he didn't know. Like that inner voice was saying he didn't know. And I'm listening to him talking. And I would get that 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 strong and say he didn't know. I was like. I didn't know that Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. But that voice kept telling me he didn't like some of the things he was, he said and did and his bearing and his being. He, he didn't know what he was doing, but I'm, I'm here to forgive you anyway. So literally so many people saw this heart change and literally like I went to work. This happened on a Sunday morning and I, I went to work on Monday and some of my coworkers like, what happened to you? And I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, you look different, you know, and it was, it was, I went from literally from hate to love and it was like, so everybody's asking me what happened to you? And I'm like, I, I didn't do nothing, but there was one person I was, I shared with, um, he was a truck driver and I had to fill his truck up almost like every day. And I shared with him, he, he's, uh, he was like, oh yeah, God is calling you. I'm like, what are you talking about? God is calling me. He says, that's something, that's that's God's territory. What that was, was God's territory. He does what just happened to you. You didn't do that. God did that. And I was like, look, dude, you don't know me. <laughs> you don't know me. I'm not a good person. I've done some evil things in my life. I'm the last person God would be interested in. And so he says, no, you're exactly the person. Then he tells me the story of Saul getting converted to Paul. You know that story? And I was like, yeah. I was like, really? A guy who killed Christians and God called him? So that's when I thought, okay, maybe, maybe God could be interested. Because we don't, we don't, you know, when when people who don't know the Lord think about the Lord, they don't think he wants anything to do with them. He would never want me where I came from and who I came from, because that's how you identify yourself. You identify yourself as where you came from or who you came from, or what you did, but that's not the gospel. Gospel doesn't identify you. It identifies you as a sinner, but offers you the ability for forgiveness and being born again, being reclassified. <laughs> but at any rate, um, he gives me this Bible. I drive around for three weeks with it. Just I had a, a 1984 Ford LTD. And that Bible just went back and forth across the dashboard of that car for three weeks. I'd turn right, go that way. I'd turn left, go that way. One day, and, and there ain't a thing in the world, Stephen, that's bothering me. And people were like, you really have, you really have changed. And before I, were, I was cussing, like three weeks went by and I realized I hadn't said a cuss word. And some people would say something like, you know, they'd get into a fight or they'd get into an argument and stuff. And I'd be like, wait, 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 da 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 and they would both look at me like, what the? Because it, it shut the whole thing down. And then they'd be like, where did you get that from? And I'm like, I don't really know. So I'm, some of these things that are coming, I'm starting to write down. So I'm just going to, long story short, I got that Bible out and I read it. It was something, something that really got on me that day. That was it. I, I opened the Bible up. I read it. And God had prepared me to read and just literally, I was like, I knew that what was happening in me was in this book. What's happening to me and in me is what's in this book. And I, I did the same thing. I got down. I said, Jesus, I believe you. I, I believe you died for me. I mean, I, I, I held it in my hand that day. until I got enough of the story to get down and, you know, accept Jesus. Then I called the church and said, I just accepted Jesus. I want to come and make sure I accepted Jesus. <laughs> So the pastor says, come on over. I was like one of the craziest converts he ever had. I came in saying, I believe in Jesus. You know, I read, But that's how it works. That's the power yeah. of the word. But that's just, 
that's a that's a short version of the story. It it's it was a crazy life, and it was it was something that somebody would say, "Well, that's an unusual." God still works miraculous ways, you know. He's oh, he's yeah. you know, I'm I'm a firm 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 believer in the word, you know, not going into these experiences. My experience, it's not every experience. Your experience isn't even everybody's experience. But these, it's not, doesn't mean that there aren't still miraculous works that God does on his own. And when he does them, those people are probably the most likely people to be um, activists in those experiences happening in the lives of other people. Yeah. So I, now you're, you're kind of an activist in people's lives for that. Do so you want to tell me a little bit about that? Like the work you're doing now? Yeah, well, in 2017, and Rob, that's an awesome testimony. One day I've got to get the whole story because if that's just a little bit of the story, I need all of it. <laughs> uh, in 2017, about May, um, they came into the federal prison. They locked me up and they put me in there. I would end up staying in there for 377 days in solitary confinement in a room by myself. Now, the front of the cell was bars in this situation because it's a very old prison. The older prison still has bars. So I was able to communicate with my neighbors and other people that were up and down the hall. Um, what happened was from about 2012 to about 2017, I had just gotten away from God. You know, I was in the middle of a 22 year sentence I felt like I was losing myself a little bit. I'd been transferred all over the country. Remember, I started in Florida. And since 2003, I'd been in Florida and Georgia, Oklahoma, uh, North Carolina, Virginia. Now I was back in my home state of Illinois. I'd been in prison in all of them different states around a whole different crew of rowdy dudes everywhere. And, I, and for probably five years there, man, I'd lost myself. And in 2017, they came, they locked me up, they put me in solitary confinement. And when I went to solitary confinement in this place, they didn't allow you to have much property. And when they brought your property to you, your normal property that you would have in general population, you normally would have all your clothes and your tennis shoes and your radios and your food and things like that. They didn't do that in here. They brought you a pair of shower shoes and a radio, two items. Well, when they brought me my property, they brought me a pair of shower shoes, a radio, and a Bible that had been sitting in the bottom of my locker. And it kind of started from there, man. I took a couple weeks. I felt like God was on me a little bit. I grabbed the Bible up again. I started reading in there. I started talking to the Lord. I was pretty ashamed. I was suffering from a lot of condemnation. That's a big trick of the enemy is condemnation. Where you been? You know? You ain't been praying like you was, you know what I mean? You still call yourself a Christian. You know, he he loves those tricks. He tries to make you feel guilty about even coming back to God and getting back right with God. So I started back reading the word and uh, praying and, you know, just easing into it. And about two months in, two and a half months in, I got a hold of a book by Derek Prince. Now, before this time, I'd read everything I could get a hold of by Smith Wigglesworth John G. Lake, Catherine Kuhlman, all the famous old-time Pentecostal full gospel people that walked in in God's power, Mariah Woodruff, that are, I'd been reading those since 03, 04, but I hadn't been reading them in the last five years. So I started to get a hold of some of those books again. And then I got a hold of a book by Derek Prince. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Derek Prince. He passed away some years back, but he was 85, 90 years old, powerful man of God. Oh, okay, yeah, I know who you're talking about. And the book was about fasting. And Derek Prince said in the book, he, he, he said he considered himself to be an expert on fasting. He had done some very long fasts, month-long fasts. His wife had, and they had the power of God moving in their life a lot. They'd done a lot of spiritual warfare and seen a lot of people healed miracles. And he said, if you want the course of your life to change, if you want to change the course of your life, he said, I believe a week-long fast will do it. But he said, you can't just run in there and do a week-long fast. You have to build up to it. So I set my face towards God, and I decided to start doing it, even though I'm a pretty skinny guy. A, a day or two fast hurts me pretty bad. But after 
a week, I got up to a week or two, I got up to a three day fast. And I said, you know what, Lord, I need you. I need to change the course of my life or I'm going to get out of prison after 22 years and be and be a bad guy. So I, I did it. You know, I went in there and I did a week long fast and Robert changed the course of my life. And during the court and during that time, probably about the third day of that fast, my prayer language changed the way that I had always prayed in tongues. The prayer language that I received when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in 2004, it just changed into something else. Uh, it got a lot faster and I could barely keep my mouth moving fast enough to get the, the syllables out of, out of my mouth. And it just, it opened up a supernatural doorway. And I just started praying from that time forward. I would pray for three hours, four hours. I had a couple weeks there where I prayed five hours a day, just in tongues alone. And um, continued a, a routine of fasting every day, every week, at least one day. And then sometimes if God would put a fast on me for a specific reason, I might go two or three days. And it hurt my body, you know what I mean? But at the same time, God's grace was greater. And the door was open. So the men that were around me, some of them that knew me from being on the compound and knew that I was a pretty hard man, they had to, they were taking notice of what was going on. And they would ask me questions about the Bible. I'd come up to the front of the bars and I'd explain, um, you know, whatever questions they had, you know, because you had different denominations and faiths all up and down the tiers and everybody back there was in solitary confinement. And they had questions. There's some guys down the hall reading the Quran, and, and guys next to me are maybe a Baptist, and this guy's a, a holiness, and this guy's a Jehovah Witness, and here come the questions. And I'm just going to the Word every night, every night. And it turned out to be where I would just get up there and preach the Word. Well, and then I would spend, of course, my time with the Lord by myself, praying, fasting, and that's when He just came with the supernatural brother. I mean, He started giving me dreams. Um, he would tell me the names of people that would be coming to that tier. I would write them down, give them to my neighbor on a piece of paper the next day. Um, I, th I mean, there's a very specific example. This was the second time that he had given me a dream where it was just a name. And uh, the first time I didn't record it, I just locked the name in because I didn't know the person. And the person showed up in the unit. And he was from some other part of America, some other prison to another country, got transferred to this prison and moved a couple doors down from me. And God had given me his name. So I knew the Lord wanted to speak to the man. I didn't know what about, but I knew that he did. So in this instance, I woke up the next day. I had a name. I wrote it down. I gave it to my neighbor, handed it to him outside the bars. He's a big skinhead looking guy. He's got a tattoo on his neck all throughout. Just, just a big gnarly looking guy. But he's been back there listening to the word for a couple months from me, you know what I mean? And been answering questions. So I said, hey, hold on to this dog because uh, God gave me another name last night. He's like, all right, I got you. Well, the next day, they brought a couple guys in, a couple gang members, put them in cells down the hall. So I let them get settled in, let the unit settle down a little bit. I hollered down there to the dude. I said, hey, man, I ain't on nothing down here. I said, I'm a Christian, a real one. And if you don't mind me asking, home, what's your name? And he gave me his nickname. He said, my name's Hustler. And I said, well, I mean, I'm, I'm looking more for a first name, brother. If you could tell me what your first name is, man. I said, I, like I said, I'm a Christian. I ain't on none, man. And he said, my first name is Fernando. I said, okay. So my neighbor, he starts cracking up. He's got the paper. I said, look, brother, I need to holler at you, man. I said, I don't know what's going on with you, but I know the Lord Jesus is trying to get your attention. I got a piece of paper over here. It's got your name on it. I had a dream about you last night. So the other dude they brought up there with them was his celly, previous celly. So he hollered out. He said, yo, that's crazy because, dog, you was just talking about how lost you felt. So the guy hustler says, hey, man. Cut it out. I don't want to talk about this. He said, I do not want to talk about this out here on the tier because everybody can hear what we're saying. I said, no problem, man. No problem. I said, if you want to talk, man, shoot me a kite. Meaning, you know, just write it down on a piece of paper and throw it down here to me. And he did. He wrote it down there to me, told me a little bit about his life. He's a Latin king, gangbanger out of Chicago. I wrote him back and I said, listen, is it possible that somebody is out there right now in the world praying for you? Because I'd notice a pattern that when God would put somebody in my life for a significant period of time, 
I could always dissect it and ask the person, is there somebody praying for you right now that you know about? And every time they'd say, yeah, you know, it's a grandma or it's an aunt or, you know, my dad's been praying and fasting for me, whatever. So he said, yeah, my mom goes to church a lot, man, and she's been praying for me. My brother just got murdered in Chicago not long ago. Oh, wow. I said, yeah. I said, okay, bro, so you know what it is, man. I don't know what God wants from you, man, but I know the Lord is trying to get your attention. But let me tell you, that man got born again back there. He got saved. He ended up getting released from the hole. Got released back out to general population, him and the other guy. We kind of had a little ministry like that going on back there in this solitary confinement area. Where we were at, that dungeon where we were, uh, Rob, is one of the worst in America. Like on my range right there, two officers have been killed right there, gutted and killed. Um, inmates are just going crazy on a regular basis all throughout this solitary confinement because it's just dark, dank. And just, it's a, just a terrible place. It's a place that the devil loves because he operates off of fear and confusion, anxiety and things like that. An environment like that's full of it. But yeah, God, God let his light shine in there. Wow. <laughs> wow. When the Bible says the light shines in the darkness, it's not a joke. It's not a joke. No, this is real. I think it's, um, I don't know if it's number 16. Have you ever read the passage where it talks about you know, it's talked about Moses on the mountaintop and the people were there and, and there was and, and God's in a cloud. OK, and it says that Moses pressed into the thick darkness where God was and the people stood off at a distance. And I tell people all the time, like sometimes, you know, people, the darkness comes. OK, and nobody wants to be in prison, obviously, but some, sometimes the darkness comes, the, the trouble comes or the adversity comes and that's when people step back at a distance but it's the times of the darkness it's the times it's the times when it looks sometimes god is most active when it looks like he's least active you see what i'm saying but what could god be doing in a prison and i know there's a lot of folks you know talk about prison conversions and i've i've met a few of them you know they they yeah. saved in prison and they came to my church and they told me their story and yeah they i believe it was real but then you come back out here and you have all the real temptations of being outside <clears throat> that's not you know that's no joke either but yeah at any rate um god's working everywhere he's working all the time he's especially working when folks are getting prayed for and he's making those divine connections like you experienced but there's something you did. Um, talk to me about what you did. You did a talk. At Bra so, so 2017, that went on. But this Bradley talk and some of the things you're wanting to do with the, the what was that about with the violence and everything? Well, one of the things that I did was during the course of that time in, in solitary confinement, God was doing so many uh, supernatural things. You know, uh, Rob, I could give you some examples that you would say. It's, it's, they're very, very difficult to believe. But when you are living in that realm every day and it's just a complete life of prayer and fasting, like I was living at that time, you know, you, you're know, you there in the presence of God constantly because the distractions of the world have disappeared. It's just you and him. So he can operate and you're expecting him to operate in that way. As he operates in that way, your faith increases to expect more from him. I mean, I can give you an example where he literally my my food tray that they put in there because we couldn't buy like regular food items on commissary so you're looking forward to those meals so in the days when i'm not fasting i would be looking forward to the meal it was missing the main portion of that meal the tray that i received that had a lid on it and i took the lid off and I had a little piece of toast and maybe a little jelly but the eggs were missing so i went to the back of the cell and i washed my hands in the sink and i asked the lord about it and I said, Lord, you always take care of me. You always do. And I don't know why you give me this tray today that doesn't have these eggs on it. Maybe there's somebody else back here that's really hungry that needs it. You know what I mean? I didn't get an answer. I turned around and walked back to the front of the cell to where the desk is to grab the tray to eat what was on it. And I looked down and up against the bars on the outside of my cell was the biggest, giantest green apple you ever seen in your life. In a dungeon now just had to smile Rob I reached down and picked it up on the side of that apple was a cross mm. now 
I took the apple. I hollered at my neighbors. I said, y'all, y'all got to check this out. Let all my neighbors handle it, see it. We had the guards come down and look at it. They're just like, this is, I mean, I had guards coming up to the cell, putting their head up against the bar so that I could put my hand on their head and pray for them. You know what I mean? Because they know that God's real. And when they see a man that's sold out to dedicate their, himself to that level, and they see God working in that person's life, it doesn't matter what side of the fence you're on. You know what I mean? People coming for prayer. They want to see what it is. You know what I mean? They want to, they want to, they want to be around it. Uh, so what I did was I started to write these things down. I'd write them down. I had a little pen about that big that's made out of a real flexible rubber so you couldn't use it as a weapon. And I would just sit down and I would just start recording them. This is what happened today. Or I haven't heard from the Lord for a couple days. I'm not sure what's going on. Or I had a dream last night and God told me this. You know, one time he told me in a dream straight up, he said, I didn't bring you back here uh, to heal you. I brought you back here to resurrect you. You're going to leave out of here in a year, a new man. And that's what happened. I left out of there a totally new man. So I recorded all those things. The dreams continued. I had another dream in 2020 um, where he showed me scriptures on a wall in a house. And he said, this is what I want you to do when you get out. I want my word into more houses. And that's how I can, came in contact with the Peoria Next Innovation Center and started going up there to work on uh, trying to create that, to make that to where I could put more scriptures into houses. At the same time, Speaking to the director up there after being there for, you know, three months, I mentioned one day that I'd wrote a book. I sent it out of prison five pages at a time, but it was sitting in somebody's house in Florida. And he really liked it. And he, he liked the idea of it. He said, you need to get that book up here, man. And just take a look at it, man. People need to hear your story. People need, if there's somebody that it can help, it can help somebody, you know. So I said, all right. So I sent off for it. And during the course of my time up there at, uh, at Peoria Next, I started to meet a lot of people that were from Bradley University, uh, the Small Business Development Center, and um, through some networking, through learning how to use Facebook and stuff like that that didn't exist before I went to prison, I met a professor from Bradley that uh, she's a PhD. She teaches a course there at Bradley on uh, violence in America. And she asked me to come up there and speak. And she told me I could have the floor for as long as I wanted to. So I spoke for about two hours to a classroom full of future uh, judges and lawyers and prosecutors. And, um, you know, I, I gave them, uh, I couldn't give them the super spiritual. I couldn't give them the stuff that, like we're, we're talking about here right now because that's a different audience. But I had to give them some Jesus because that's what it is. You know what I mean? And you can't hide what it is when they're asking you and they're presenting a problem with violence in these streets or problems in the criminal justice system, and you're giving them solutions, the only solutions I know is the ones that I saw work in other people's lives and that work for me. And that's a real relationship with the Lord, man. And that's, you know, with the Holy Spirit and with the Lord Jesus and with the Father. you got to have that. So, yeah, we did that. They did record it, and I know they're editing the, uh, the YouTube now. I've got a couple other speaking engagements uh, based off of that. Essentially, I have another one coming up at Woodruff. I have another one coming up at ICC pretty soon. And, um, you know, just here's what I noticed, Rob. This is, this is critically important. When I, was, when I was back there in solitary confinement and for the years after that, because I didn't stay back there for the last five years of my sentence. I only stayed back there for a year and I got out. And I, and I stayed in the regular prison general population for four years in a different prison. And God would still give me dreams and show me people's names or show me something about their life that I could go and talk to the baddest monster in the unit. Uh, and one example, I, a guy showed me a guy, this guy had punched about five guys in my unit in the face. He was a giant gangster from St. Louis. God gave me a dream about him, said, I want you to go tell him about that. I don't want to go tell him about that. I'm getting ready to get out of prison after 20 years. I only got two years left. I don't want any problems. I don't want to get in trouble. You know what I mean? I'm not scared of the guy, but if I go tell him this and he wants some wreck and he wants to fight or he tries to fight me, I got to fight him. You know, I've already had my jaw broken, jails in prison. I got a steel plate in my chin. I've had my eye halfway knocked out. That was all, you know, stuff before I was born again. But I got to do it because the Lord wants me to do it. So I went talk to the man. I said, Hey, I need to talk to you for a minute, man. I said, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a born again Christian. He's like, well, no, I, you know, I really didn't know that. What's up, man. I said, I had a dream about you the other night and the Lord's been on me about talking to you about it. I'm looking at his body, Rob, as I'm telling him, seeing how he's 
receiving what I'm saying. He's got a tattoo across his forearm here that says Antichrist on it. So this is one of them guys, totally away from God. I said, in the dream, brother, you were standing there without a shirt on, and you was about nine years old, and you had a couple buck teeth sticking out, and you was just standing there, and you was extremely sad looking. Just you standing there. This is a black guy. I'm just going to describe him by his race so you can get an image of what type of person I'm talking to and what he looked like in the dream. And he said, all right. He turned around and he walked away. And that was it. I saw him a week later. I went over and sat down next to him. I said, hey, man, if you don't mind me asking, uh, did that dream mean anything to you? Because it would let me know if I'm hearing from the Lord right, you know. Tears, big ones, all in his eyes coming down his face, right there in the day room. He said, yeah, it did. He said, it did mean something to me. He said, because that was when I first got locked up. I got caught with a pistol when I was nine years old, and that's when I first got locked up. I said, the Lord wanted me to tell you, home, that he sees you like that, like you was back then, right now. And it doesn't matter what you've done in your life that led you here. He'd been in prison for 16 years at that point. I said, it doesn't matter. I said, because he still sees you just like that, like you was when you was innocent before you started getting into trouble. That's how God sees you. It really affected him. I was actually able to give him one of, I gave him one of John G. Lake's books to read, <laughs> if you can believe that. So, yeah, God does God does his things. He, he's put me, started, started to put me in touch with the right people here in Peoria where I can kind of reach out and network and help as many people possible. I'm thankful that I got to meet you. I believe that was him because I, that, I'd never been to that meeting you know what I mean I'd never been to that that to, to that house where I met you uh, to meet uh, the lady from Bradley and to meet some different people you know what I mean that have that have come in and given me the ability to maybe you know maybe help somebody you know what I mean that's my mission brother my mission is to help as many people as possible if it's getting the word in front of them if it's saying hey man here goes my book. When the book gets finished, if you can't afford it, I'll give you a copy of it. Just read it, brother. You know what I'm saying? You see, I send the PDFs out to everybody. Like, read it, please. It's a story there that if you're struggling with addict, something of that nature, man, if you're even if you're in church, brother, and you ain't struggling with none of that, and you want something deeper with God, there's something in there for that, man. Well, I'll tell you what, I would love the opportunity because we don't have these conversations, you know. We got these, we got these shootings in Peoria. We got this violence right in our own city. And you said something uh, when we were in this for two minutes, the first two or three minutes. You said something about being raised by wolves. You said you were raised by wolves. You remember saying that? Yeah. Oh yeah. And and, and people don't understand what it's like to walk in a home. Where you're hate you you literally feel hated in the home, you know what I'm saying? You you walk in a home and your your worst adversaries are behind the walls of your house. You know, like yeah. Jesus told the disciples, the man's enemies will be that of his own household. You know, it's not like you know we're born sinners, but some people are educated in the system of sin. And people don't people don't understand that, and I don't know what to do, you know, like like a parenting skill of empathy, you know. There's kids being raised by parents with absolutely no empathy. They're almost sociopathic, sociopathic yeah. parents. And and when their kid has a problem, they show absolutely no interest in it. And in fact, they demand near slavery from their children. They parentify their children. Their children end up being servants to them. And I can tell that, that you kind of identify with that, right? <laughs> I can tell. Oh, yeah. Um, and it, it, they're ravenous wolves in their own home. And I, I don't know, I don't know what to do, man. I'm beside myself. But the main thing is, to me, I, I just put this thing on Facebook today. It says, Father's, uh, Ephesians 6 4 fathers do not provoke your children to wrath but bring them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord we got these angry young men out here 
I, it's just in every young man. I'm not talking about any, any particular race of young men, but angry, you know, purposeless, pointless, who am I type of young men. And my old pastor used to say, nature abhors a vacuum. Have you ever heard that saying? Nature abhors a vacuum. If you don't put something in that place, something will get in that place. And they go out looking for what everybody in prison was looking for. They were looking for power. They were looking for purpose. And they were looking for prominence. And if nobody teaches a, a young man how to find power, purpose, and prominence in the right way, that's, the, that's especially a man's appetite to go out and get it the wrong way, you know, in the street. Yeah. And I don't know. I got a real heart for that too. And, and, and it's one thing if, if you, even, a, uh, it, it's to treat another human being like a human being, you know, uh, it's obvious that a wolf that hasn't eaten in a week is going to be what they call it ravenous. Okay going to be ravenous going to be ferocious for a meal but what uh, what about a human being that's 8 9 10 11 12 years old that has never received one one appetizer of kindness from their own parents never received one word of encouragement from their own mother from their father they received nothing but abuse and name calling and and you know just the most violent that person is going to be a ravening wolf wanting wanting something good to be you know what i would rather be the best at being bad than be in no good at being good that's what i that's the way i looked at it i said i, I we shoot you you made me feel like a complete failure but one thing i can do i can go and mess some people up i used to love I used to love to fight and I used to love to prove, oh, oh, you, you think, oh, you think you're big and bad because I had so much anger in me. I don't know if you can relate. It was like a switch. It was so powerful. The rage was so powerful. It could overpower people who were six foot, six foot six, 300 pounds, right. because you, I'm just going to turn loose 170 pounds of pure evil rage and hatred on you. With with speed, and they, they could you couldn't withstand it. People would always be like, ah, "Man, how what is what is wrong with you?" Or I mean, but it was just that stuff was in me. But my point being is, it wouldn't have been in me if I had something else deposited in me when I was younger. You know, right. the knowledge of God, the gospel, affirmation. I think everybody in the world, you know. Social media is the thing that everybody's getting validation from social media these days, going out there to get those likes. But the human being, desire, a child desires the validation of their parents. They, they, they desire, they have an appetite to receive love, to receive kindness, to receive empathy, care, to be provided for, to be protected. And when those things aren't given to them, they, yeah, they become animalistic. Yeah. That's just the natural Absolutely. consequence. Sin begets sin. Yeah. You know, a, a, an interesting thing that when I did speak to the students at Bradley, um, one of the things that I was able to say to them that helped them understand the dynamics of the spiritual realm um, that had all of them nodding their head in agreement was I asked them had they ever walked into a room where a husband and a wife had just been arguing? Had they ever pulled up to a house? Maybe their mom and dad were in the house arguing, but when they get pulled up to the house, they didn't know they were arguing because by the time they got in the house, their mom and dad were smiling at them. How was your day today? Becky, are you hungry? Mm -hmm. You know, Johnny, how was your day? They're not letting on that they've been fighting, but you know they have because you feel it because the atmosphere is charged with it. And that's what's been going on in that spiritual realm. There's a lot in the Bible that talks about that. When Paul would talk about when this is present, then every form of this and this and this and this are all present. They come running. And I learned that lesson in prison. If two guys were getting in an argument, every form of confusion and chaos would jump on that and come to there. And the next thing you know, there's 70 guys there. 
everybody's arguing about to fight and go crazy and they don't even know why it's like a mob type of mentality mm -hmm. but something happens in the atmosphere that's charged mm -hmm. but when you're raised like that and your house is constantly charged with that atmosphere and your neighbor's houses are charged with that atmosphere you become desensitized to it you're used to it the enemy can kind of have his way with your mind or your emotions at that stage of your life and that's the stage you're developing mm -hmm. the first time that i really walked into a house that i could feel absolute love in and realized that something was different about this house something was different about the environment that i walked into i was 17 years old and i was like man what is different about this place <laughs> it's it's not that it's so much cleaner than even what it was was that the husband loved the wife and the wife loved the husband they had two children that had since graduated from college and moved out they were pretty successful people but they loved their children you know what i mean and they just everything in that environment exuded love even when the house was empty bro you know what i mean so you know with the way that i believe in my my walk with the lord and I believe that scripture backs me up on this. When you were talking about something that Paul was saying earlier, and he said, listen, don't, you know, kind of like, don't think I won't know what you guys been up there when I, when I get to where you guys are at based on the words you say, no, 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 no. I'll know by the power. I'll know by the power. So it's kind of in the area of scripture where you were talking about earlier. And he says that he said, because this gospel wasn't preached with all these, you know, fancy words, but it, you know, it's in power and demonstration of the spirit. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the Christian, is supposed to be a possessor of the Holy Spirit to such a high degree that they can give that to someone. Maybe not the Holy Spirit directly, because maybe the person's not in position right then to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but change the very environment that they walk into. You know what I mean? I believe that with all my heart, and maybe it takes a, a, a higher level of dedication maybe it takes a higher level of fasting which nobody likes to talk about because it hurts man and it sucks you know what i mean but when you're drawn close to god and drawn closer to god it doesn't suck because you know you're hearing from god in that way and then that atmosphere and that environment can be changed you know that that's the way that i believe i believe that scripture backs me up on that but i lived it brother because in that solitary confinement range that i was on for a year Guys were killing themselves, man. Guys were cutting themselves with razor blades. They'd take batteries and they'd look at the officer and they'd swallow a battery so that the officers, they would have to hit the panic button and take them out of there and they'd take them to medical or something to get it out of them. And there would be human feces and they would take them and you wouldn't even know what was going on, but you'd smell it and then they'd rub it all on the walls. This was a tremendous demonic atmosphere for that type of stuff. But one man, Two men, three men, totally sold out to the Lord, almost demanding of God for his presence to be there, asking for the Holy Spirit, fill me with the Holy Spirit. I saw two men back there not only get born again, but receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it wasn't that easy. Now that I come out of prison, I see a lot of easy salvations and easy baptisms, and I'm not really sure if that's right, because what I saw in there wasn't like that. When these guys were asking, after they were born again, they were reading their Bibles every day, and I'd send them books like God's Generals by Robert Slairdon, or I'd send them The Cross and the Switchblade, or I'd send them something, and they'd dissect it and read it, and we'd go back and forth with it. They were always asking for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'd teach them how to pray for it, but they weren't receiving. But when I got them to take it to that next level, to go into fasting for one day or two or three days, they would end up receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit in a room by themselves, nobody praying for them, nobody teaching them how to pray in tongues or anything like that. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I, I believe I learned a lot from that. I'm hoping that I can utilize some of that to maybe help now that I'm out here, you know what I mean, to help, you know, to, to help somebody, you know what I mean? Maybe it's one guy. I don't know who it's going to be, but I know that God wants to use me in that way. He's been on me about it. I'll tell you that because when I first got out, I started going out to ICC and I took a construction course and I was, you know, that's what I thought I was going to do coming out of prison. I'm going to be a regular guy. I need to learn how to use a cell phone. I don't know how to use an iPhone. I've never been on Facebook. It didn't exist when I went to prison. Mm -hmm. I'd like to find a good wife. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And the Lord spoke to me so clear, bro, a week after I was out, after I was going to those classes, he said, if you don't do what I asked you to do, I'm going to give it to somebody else. I said, okay, that's it. I'm going to do it. I have to. You know what I mean? I don't have a choice. You know, so.
Yeah. Well, all right, man. Um, it sounds like you got uh, a lot of excite- exciting adventures um, in your future. <laughs> He's put me with the right people, Rob, man. He's put me with the right people. Guys like you, um, guys like Angel, and, and over there at Riverside, and, you know, the right people to, um, you know what I mean, to network and come together. Guys that are strong in the faith, man, I see the way you guys are, man. You know what I mean? I know you're a dedicated dude, man, without question. Before before I came on here, you know what I mean, for this today, I asked a, a couple of the men that I've met that I really respect in the Christian community here, and one of them was uh, Angel Cruz. And he said, man, that's my man, and he's all the way with the Lord. And that's the green light for me. That You know, that right there, that, that verification said, yeah, we got to get together, man, and, and I appreciate it, you know. Yeah, and, and, and the thing is uh... – the discipleship aspect of it is the discipleship aspect of life. And that's why I asked you, are you disciples? And, and that is, that is the, that is the work behind the scenes, but that's the real work that builds lives that, that transforms lives, that saves souls, that, that mentors people who are, you know, I'm not going to, who are less, less further along than, than you are in the in the Lord. Yeah. That's the life transformational work. I think that's what's missing in in the church, the discipleship aspect of it. Um, you know, the, being with these guys every Thursday night, crying with people, laughing with people, breaking up fights, <laughs> being yeah. being there, breaking up fights between people, being the ambassador of reconciliation, bringing those same people back together, going to brother so and so and saying. Helping them see the other person, you know, and then you bring them back together. You bring Rex. That's what Christ does. That's what Christ did for us to God. That's what we do among one another to, to build us into maturity. And um, I'm going to say, whew, there was this once a desire to be like, like the ideal type of christian like a pastor or something over a church and yeah, like yeah and now it's like i'm like that was that was like man's idea that's like the typical uh, path to to success in the kingdom you think yeah but then Perfect. god shows you no th- this path this harder path this path of less prominence this path of of no pro, pro no prestige no accolades no fans, no applause. This is the pathway to real success in the kingdom, to real cred in the kingdom. You know, no, there wasn't anybody, there wasn't cameras and lights in those prison cells with those men you were working to, with, but that was trans, That was life transformation. I remember this, um, and this, this, these things, I don't need, like, God gives me supernatural when I need it. I'm all about, like, you worry about the natural, pray for the supernatural, but but don't think you're wielding the supernatural. We yield, right. we yield to things God's wanting to do. But do, do you get my point? You're not a wielder, yeah. you're a yielder. You're just making, Lord, use me. And when I first became a believer, I went to this church and, and I was I was gonna help put the floor the, the tile in, and it used to be an old hardware store. And it had hardware store tiling on it. So they said, hey, we need volunteers to break up the tiling on the floor, you know, on Saturday. And I was at that time, I was like, oh, you need volunteers to put up drywall? Oh, you need volunteers? To do-? I was just a volunteer for everything. I was like, I'll volunteer. So I go in there and to break up this tile. And these there was these two old dudes. <laughs> they were about, I don't know, they might have been, at the time, I was only in my 20s. But they might have been, they might have been 40 or 50, but... My memory says they were old dudes, get it? And they go over and they got these long sticks and they got the thing on the end of them and they're like, and like every time they would swipe with this, like all these tiles would just bust it up to the floor. So I went and did that where I was at and I was like, cheek, little tiny microscopic chip came up off the floor. The tile wouldn't even, and so I was like, cheek, every time I hit, Steve, one little tiny thing came up. So I look around where I'm at and I'm at the area where the cash registers sat when it was a store and where all the customers constantly trafficked and where the shopping carts are going across this area. That's the area I'm working in. 
And these guys are like, brr, brr, brr. <laughs> they, they've covered 20 feet, and I've gotten two or three chips. And I literally, this is where I felt like the Lord <coughs> spoke to me in this also. Like something in my spirit spoke to me and said, this is the work I have prepared for you. And I was like, what? And it told me that that work that those men were doing, literally anybody could do that. A child could do what they're doing. But this work, this this chipping away at that at that hard, pressed in filth and dirt and and sin and self condemnation and you know the the people who who God had so you know um, who who sin and Satan had so deformed them you know and they don't believe that the, you know discipling those people and mentoring those people and bringing them breaking off that outer shell of that false self that false identity bringing them the gospel and leading them you know parenting them to new life that's hard work man and most people aren't in it and you know what the bible clearly says that we're to you know we're to be there we're to disciple others you know to be there for one another to like lazarus when jesus called him out of the grave you know he told, Jesus didn't move the stone away. Jesus told the community, roll the stone away, if you get what I'm saying. The, com the people who were bystanders, roll the stone away. Sometimes we have to be stone rollers. And then he calls Lazarus forth from the tomb. He says to the community, Re remove the grave clothes. Help take off the things that were identifying him so that we can re-identify him back with life again. To me, that's that's a little um, that's that's what we're called to do. You coming out of prison, you had grave clothes on you. Part of our role in life is to help pull those grave clothes off you and tell you you're a new creation. Two Corinthians five seventeen says, "Behold, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, old things have passed away; all things have become new." That's true of you. You are not what you did. You are not where you came from. You are not who you came from. You are who called you out of darkness and into his glorious light. But you are a royal priesthood. You are part of a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Never let go of that. Never let go of that. Because... All the devil wants to do is, as you said, well, I know where you came from. I know who you came from. I know what you did. Not in Christ, you don't. I am none of those things. I am not who I was, and I'm not who I will be. Mm. Yeah, Praise bro. God. That's awesome. Hey, let's have a word of prayer, and I'm going to quit this recording, okay? Sounds good. Yeah, let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this conversation tonight. I believe this will trust t touch the lives of many. Thank you for the inspiring story of what you've done in Stephen's life. And may you encourage someone else to come out of the darkness that they've been in and to walk into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. And that they can only do so by the blood of Jesus, by receiving him. Uh, we ask that you would bless this word and may it accomplish life into the lives of others who hear and receive it. Inspiration, hope, edification, and affirmation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, look, the word of God says, you know, and, and we know we can all be rejected from our household, but the word of God says that, um, that Jesus went to his own people. He went to his own and his own received him not. But to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become a child of God. A child born not of natural descent or of a human decision or of a husband's will, but a child born of God. That's what the word of God says in the Gospel of John. So like I did and like Stephen did, we received him into our lives. We confessed our sins. We confessed that we were aliens and enemies of God. We forsook our old ways. We repented of who we were, who we thought we were, and all that we had done. And we turned to Christ and received him as Lord and Savior. 
And he made us children of God. Born again. Amen. Amen, Stephen. Amen, brother. And um, if you're out there and you feel like you're broke, you've been broke, busted, and disgusted, everything but a child of God, and your sins cause you to feel like that, the Bible says that he will wash your sins away and they will be as white as snow. That he takes your sins when you confess your sins. He casts them in a sea of forgetfulness. They are as far as the east is from the west. He remembers them no more when we confess them. We have a memory problem. We're the ones that can't let them go. So I encourage you to do that tonight. Make Christ the Lord and Savior of your life. And you will be a child of God. Peace and love in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.